All right, hello everybody. This is Alexander Damron. Welcome to our interesting cases in breast pathology, the case of the month. This is the second case um, on my channel regarding the interesting cases of the month. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last one. Um, that was June. This is August, so I did miss July as I was moving. I um, hope you understand that, but we're getting right back to it. And I have a good case for you here. This is a very interesting case. Hopefully it sparks some discussion and some thought because we really don't know um, you know, how these types of cases that I'm going to show you today are going to clinically behave. And that's one of the issues with this lesion is the rarity of it. And how do we diagnose it and how do we differentiate it from other similar lesions? Um, so let's go ahead and get started. But just before we do, of course, um, I do have permission from Expert Path to use some of their images in these presentations. So you will see some of their images. Their logo will be on those. You can follow me on Twitter at adamronmd. And, uh, you know, I do post some cases of the week there. Don't rush breast cases of the week. Uh, so follow me on there for some additional stuff. And let's jump right into this case. And our case is a 58 year old female with a two and a half centimeter ill-defined mass, no personal history of family uh, or family history of breast cancer and other um, than this recent lesion has lived a relatively healthy life up to this point. And let's go ahead and uh, say it was biopsied. It was called uh, something that needed to be excised. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go right to the excision of this lesion. So you get something like this. And the thing to note all, you know, already on low power is that we don't really have our normal breast structures here, right? This is really just an infiltrative epithelial looking uh, cell population that is in this stroma, right? We don't really see any normal architecture, any normal breast tissue. And we're gonna look a little closer at this lesion. Um, a little bit higher power, again, we're gonna go higher and higher as we move forward. But this, these cells kind of have a basaloid appearance, very solid. Uh, maybe on low power, we're seeing some matrix production by this tumor. And if we look a little bit higher power, we see areas like this that have this very characteristic look. And we're going to look a little closer um, to at this as well. But you can see it almost has these nice, uh, almost as if it used to be well circumscribed. Maybe this nest was. Uh, but now overall, it's very solid. And it has these very characteristic pink material kind of throughout the tumor. You're starting to see it. These small little uh, nests of this pink, almost hyalinized material. And if we look again closer at that, we're seeing more of this. It starts kind of standing out to us. So what is that? You know, is it collagen? Is it a basement membrane-like material? Maybe it's, you know, hyalinized at this point. But, and then our background, you know, and that's going to trigger your thought right there, right? Oh, maybe uh, we're dealing with something that has basement membrane-like material because that's unusual. We don't typically see that in, say, a just solid uh, tumor of the breast, right? A poorly differentiated tumor that's just solid typically doesn't have that um, component to it. So that should already clue you in, though, there's something a little different about this lesion. And the nuclei themselves, you know, they are pretty pleomorphic, right? Um, they're basaloid appearing. They don't really have any direction to them. Um, they do surround this material, but overall it looks more higher grade than you typically see. Again, just a little higher power of this membrane uh, material here that we're seeing. Again, these small little nests of this material with the cells around it. Um, and again, but if you look at these cells here, again, very solid, maybe a mitosis there and the um, extra, you know, cellular kind of matrix production that is being done by this tumor. We saw areas like this within the tumor and then other areas that are very solid. Lots of mitoses in this case, and that's something to take note of, right? We have one here. Here's a blurry mitosis up in here. Uh, great camera work. Uh, but this is another one here, maybe. No, there's another mitosis there. Uh, lots of mitosis associated with this lesion. And then the epithelial cells or epithelial-like, maybe my epithelial-like cells, who knows, um, are very solid. Okay, and these cells themselves are pretty pleomorphic. So we're clearly in the malignant category here um, within this lesion and the way that it infiltrates in this solid pattern kind of going throughout the breast that we saw in lower power with really no recognizable normal breast within those images. Again, just another example of this kind of matrix-like material that we're seeing uh, throughout the tumor. And more importantly, um, what we're seeing is, again, the high mitotic activity, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 
uh, eight, maybe mitosis just right here on this high power image. And the nuclei themselves are also very pleomorphic, right? We have very large nuclei, um, very pleomorphic, almost sometimes a little vesicular, almost nuclei, but overall, very high grade looking lesion. Um, so your radar has to be up, right? Or, okay, we're dealing with a malignant uh, tumor here, something something's not completely right though it's not just a ductal carcinoma we have some features that we should think about to further um, our knowledge so what's the differential that you're thinking about well could it be just a poorly differentiated ductal carcinoma you know no special type maybe i don't really think so there's clearly some features of this tumor that are pretty unique that we typically don't see just in a nos type case could it be a metaplastic carcinoma that's certainly a possibility we have some matrix production um, you often see that in metaplastic carcinomas didn't really see a spindle cell component um, although some of the cells did have a spindle you know form to them so it's certainly worth a differential could it be a cribriform carcinoma and those were cribriform spaces that have hyalinized now and maybe that's what it is maybe but typically those are lower grade invasive tumors right and maybe that doesn't really you know fit this type of histology could it be an adenomyopithelial carcinomas could it be something that arose from an adenomyopithelioma and now we've had malignant transformation of the myopithelial or the epithelial component that's certainly worth the difference differential. Adenoid cystic carcinoma is something you should think about with that kind of membrane-like material that we saw, but it's a little higher grade than we typically see. So another variant of that could be the solid variant, um, but even if we called it the solid variant adenoid cystic carcinoma, wouldn't it be a little high grade for that even? You know, nuclei, high mitotic activity, maybe we should think about, you know, does that truly fit into that category? So a uh, very interesting differential just from the histology of the tumor. But a couple of things that you can go ahead and cross off are the invasive cribriform carcinoma, right? This is too high grade. Um, cribriform carcinoma is going to look a lot different than this. Uh, very low grade, almost uh, invades through the breast with very little stromal reaction to it. Um, you know, often associated with, you know, a tubular carcinoma with these tubular and cribriform invasive components, very low grade. And again, adenoid cystic carcinoma, again, this is also too high grade, right? We have these kind of infiltrative patterns. We have, um, you know, high mitotic activity. So we'll talk a little bit about why this can't simply just be called adenoid cystic carcinoma later on. But that still leaves us with the higher grade things, right? An adenomyopithelial carcinoma, a high grade ACC solid variant or basaloid variant, a metaplastic carcinoma carcinoma even, or just an IDC. So what can you do? Well, there's always a few things you can do. And one of us uh, things that we always like to do is some immunohistochemical chemical stains to help us further characterize this lesion. And as you may have thought, some of the things that we obviously are going to be doing in breast cases is our ERPR HER2. In this case, it's going to be negative. Um, everything came back as negative. And because of the histology, one of the things you're thinking about or one of the things that should be on your radar is an adenoid cystic or a malignant transformation of an adenomyopithelioma. And we know both of these lesions are characterized by having luminal and myoepithelial-like cells. So it's a dual cell population involved in these tumors. And those are often highlighted by luminal stains and myoepithelial stains. So a CK7 and a P63 would show a dual population of cells within this tumor. And in fact, that's what this did. This case showed a predominant of the myoepithelial cells, the P63. However, there were scattered CK7 luminal-like cells within this lesion as well. CD117 or CD117 C kit, that's something that is going to clue you in of where we're heading. That also stained the luminal-like cells. But keep in mind that C kit, while you know its positivity is associated with the lesion kind of we're heading towards, remember we can see C kit positivity in breast tumors that display a basaloid phenotype. Triple negative tumors can be CD117 so positive. So it's not necessarily a uh, no all end all stain for cases that are heading into our uh, what we're heading into. Hmm. So this is interesting. I hope you think this is an interesting case and you're kind of thinking, well, you know, he's leading me down the path of an adenoid cystic carcinoma. And certainly indeed I am. 
And that's what we ended up diagnosing this case as, is a high-grade adenoid cystic carcinoma solid or basaloid variant. And there's a big difference between using this terminology um, versus just calling it an adenoid cystic carcinoma. And we're going to talk about that because it's extremely important that you don't just call these cases simply an adenoid cystic carcinoma. That is a very specific diagnosis that must meet you know, specific histologic classification because of the way that they are treated by clinicians. So let's take a step back here, and we're looking at a more traditional adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? Um, we have these very large nests of tumor that are infiltrating throughout the breast, and you can see these uh, sort of you know, hyalinized basement membrane-like material, actually very similar to what we saw in our case. And then we also have these luminal spaces that aren't filled with that material. And that's very classic for, you know, these luminal spaces are lined by the luminal-like cells, and these spaces are lined by myoepithelial-like cells that actually secrete this basement membrane-like material. And sometimes it will hyalinize. And in our case, you could imagine that all this became hyalinized as the tumor became more solid and more high-grade. And there are several different histologic types of adenoid cystic carcinoma, but just know that ours didn't quite fit that, right? It was a little higher grade, mitotically active, infiltrating throughout the tumor. It was more of, you know, similar to what we're seeing over here, these solid nests of, you know, cells right on lower power and this solid basaloid variant of adenoid cystic is kind of in the realm that we were approaching and when you start seeing the dual cell population staining in here the CD117 staining you should have the solid variant in your mind and the solid variant has a different behavior, a different clinical course, because these are the ones that could uh, potentially go to lymph nodes. There's been cases of the solid variant having a more aggressive outcome than just your classic adenoid cystic carcinoma. So just keep that in mind that now we have, you know, again, this is not this is not our case. We're going back. We're just talking about adenoid cystic carcinoma, right? We have the two distinct cell types, these luminal cells that are in these, you know, luminal spaces that aren't filled with material. Myoepithelial cells tend to surround this basement membrane-like material, and your luminal cells are going to be positive for luminal markers in the breast, CD, uh, CK7, and these are the cells that are going to be CD117 positive, whereas your myoepithelial like cells are going to stain with your myopithelial markers, right? P63, CK56, calponin, and other stains like that. And this is a low-grade tumor. When you have this classic features, this is a very low-grade malignant tumor that is actually generally cured by complete excision with an excellent survival. And generally, they don't need radiation. They don't need chemotherapy. But if you send these tumors to, say, an oncotype or something like that, they'll actually come back with a high score. And that's because they're triple negative. But we know clinically that these behave very well. And 90% of adenoid cystic carcinomas are associated with a very distinct translocation, this 6-9 gene fusion that is going to be seen. But keep in mind, 10% of these may not have that gene fusion. And more importantly, when we get to the higher grade lesions, that fusion may not be there. And the distinguishment between the higher grade lesions and say an adenomyopathelial carcinoma can be that much more difficult if you don't have that gene fusion fusion and uh, CD117 maybe isn't helping you as much either. So this is uh, just the CD117 staining. You can see that here. You're going to see that positive in the uh, you know, luminal-like cells. And then the P63 is going to highlight the myoepithelial-like cells. So again, showing you that dual cell population in these tumors. As I mentioned, we really only should classify adenoid cystic carcinoma when these classic features are present um, because, as I mentioned, with the clinical relevance, right, the histology is going to guide these decisions of, hey, maybe we only need to do a excision, right, no matter what the oncotype score comes back as because this is going to behave well. And although it is rare, even if you make this diagnosis on biopsy, they probably are still going to send you an axillary sentinel node with these excisions. And technically, this is a subtype of adenomyopathelial carcinoma with, a, with those specific histologic features that we've discussed. So let's 
diverge again a little bit and talk a little bit about adenomyopothelioma. Adenomyopothelioma is a benign lesion. It's composed of the luminal and myoepithelial cell populations, and these are going to be very well circumscribed mass, very low grade lesions. The thing to note about these is that an adenomyopothelial carcinoma can arise from these, and the epithelial and or the myopithelial component can have malignant transformation. And something to help you is when you have this malignant transformation, and something that I was taught throughout my fellowship and something that I think is very useful, is if you're going to call it an adenomyopithelial carcinoma, then you should be able to identify somewhere in the lesion a more traditional adenomyopithelioma that this arose from. And one of the differences between this and an adenoid cystic carcinoma is that adenomyopitheliomas and carcinomas that arise from them typically do not have the same uh, basement membrane-like material production that you're seeing in an adenoid cystic. And also the translocation isn't going to always be there. But remember, that's not always 100%. It does have other translocations and other gene fusions, but that classic one of adenoid cystic can help you. And also the CD117 can help you, uh, but you know, not it's not going to be 100%. As these basaloid tumors uh, you know, are in the breast, CD117 positivity is something that we actually see often in these more basaloid lesions. So this is a immunohistochemical dual stain showing the luminal cells and the myopithelial cells as both a component in this lesion. So back to our case. Well, well, Dr. Damron, you called it. You said it was a high-grade adenoid cystic, and now you're telling me that those don't behave. That this one's a little higher grade. So, you know, how do I, you know, how do I know that this is something that's not going to behave well, or if it is going to behave well? Well, you're absolutely right. We can't call this just an adenoid cystic carcinoma, and we typically just don't have enough data to understand the true pathogenesis of these higher-grade lesions that we suspect began as maybe an adenoid cystic carcinoma, but this particular tumor is higher grade, more mitosis. It's got a solid or infiltrative pattern that's a little different than what we see in traditional adenoid cystic carcinomas. And in fact, if you see a case like this that has just tons of mitosis and high pleomorphism and solid basaloid growth pattern, ask yourself, would I be comfortable with just surgical excision in a case like this? And then the answer is probably gonna be no. You'd probably say, well, I don't think that this is a case that's just gonna be okay with surgical excision and let it go as if it's a benign lesion, right? And that's something that we struggle with because we just don't have enough of these cases to reliably predict how these tumors are gonna behave. And it has been suggested to grade adenoid cystic carcinomas based on the percent of their solid component, you know, with something that has greater than 30% solid component being a grade three, you know, yada, yada. But we still, you know, we know that grading like that still hasn't really correlated with the clinical outcome of these patients because the vast majority of adenoid cystic carcinoma is going to behave well. And when we have these higher grade lesions and all of a sudden this, this patient over here has presented with metastasis, I had a case where um, a patient had a solid basaloid type high grade adenoid cystic carcinoma uh, granted, she decided to decline all treatment, but she presented later with bone metastasis. So maybe that is a natural disease progression in these cases. We just don't know because there's just not enough cases and the rarity of these being um, just those lesions themselves is rare, but again, being the higher grade variants of these lesions is, is even more rare. So how do we treat those and how do we go forward? Um, that's something that's going to evolve over time. Uh, but we do know there are cases of patients that have this quote unquote high grade adenoid cystic carcinoma or these adenomyopithelial carcinomas that have displayed an aggressive clinical behavior. We know that. We just haven't figured out how exactly to classify or how exactly should we identify these lesions uh, more accurately. So in our case, you know, we'll go back. So we call this a high-grade adenoid cystic carcinoma, solid or basaloid variant. 
And I think the most important thing to take home from this is that when you have a case like this, you need to communicate with the clinician, the surgeon, so that you're on the same page. Hey, you know, this is, is, is staining like an adenoid cystic. It has this basement membrane-like material, but it's high grade. This is not a traditional adenoid cystic carcinoma. And often what I've seen is that oncologists and surgeons will treat these essentially like a triple negative breast cancer uh, and not an adenoid cystic, aka they're going to offer chemotherapy or they're going to offer radiation. And and that's just because we just don't have that data to evaluate and understand this tumor's clinical behavior and course. And differentiating, you know, say a high-grade adenoid cystic solid variant from malignant transformation of an adenomyopathelioma to an adenomyopathelial carcinoma is difficult. And sometimes it may not even be possible, but just remember that ACC is a subtype of adenomyopathelial carcinoma with classic histology. But it's still much more difficult to differentiate once these lesions have, you know, got into that high grade range with lots of mitosis, solid components. I think that differentiation becomes a little bit more difficult. Trying to do the molecular data, if you get the translocation, that's going to come back and say, yes, this has the translocation of adenoid cystic carcinoma. Boom, that's that's great. You've got that information. But if it comes back as negative, then you know you're still stuck in the same boat because 10% of these aren't going to have that translocation. So so that's something to keep in mind. And I, I just pulled this off of, uh, you know, ImmunoQuery. And I said, well, I wonder if they have a, uh, you know, an IHC panel that would help differentiate. And, and turns out there's a bunch of X's that say does not differentiate. Um, so just to show you that, you know, making the distinction between these, these two lesions can be very, very difficult, especially once we've had uh, this more solid, higher grade kind of uh, lesion between the two. So just a few um, tidbits. Again, uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas and adenomyopathelomas are rare lesions in the breast. And the higher grade variants of both of these lesions are even rarer and can be very difficult to distinguish, although both have similar uncertain clinical course due to the rarity. Um, both of these lesions are still kind of in that realm of we're not really sure how this is going to behave clinically. There are cases that have shown to have aggressive behavior, and there are cases that have, have shown to have not necessarily aggressive behavior, and the patient has done very well. And remember that ACC is a sub type of adenomyopathelial carcinoma with that specific histologic type. And when you see a higher grade lesion, look for clues in the tumor to see if features of an ACC are present, like in our case, the areas where it had that basement membrane-like material, and that clued us in, like, hey, let's do a CK56, let's do a P63, let's do a CD117, and see what shows up. And the last thing to note, again, is that the clinical course of these lesions is really uncertain. Um, so we can't if a clinician call you make this diagnosis they call you like oh well, what does that mean is that going to have an aggressive course I don't know right I, I don't know the answer to that but I do know that there are case reports of lesions like this that have displayed aggressive behavior does that mean this particular one will or will not that's something that only time will tell and as we get more data maybe we'll have that information in the future so I hope you guys enjoyed this case. Um, very interesting case. I hope you found it uh, educational. I hope you learned something. Um, I hope it made you think about this entity a little bit. If you like my um, interesting cases in breast pathology, please like, subscribe, and if you click the bell, you'll be notified when cases and lectures are uploaded. Again, we'll be doing cases of the month here. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter where I do Don't Rush Breast Cases of the Week and show images um, so you can check that out. If there's a specific entity that you want me to discuss or um, there's a diagnosis that you would like presented in the interesting breast cases or a type of lecture, put that in the comment. I'll respond. And um, if it's something interesting, then hopefully I can make a case for it and make a lecture for it and upload it. So I hope you all enjoyed it and we'll see you next time.